Okay, sorry about that. So in our chapter zero, we have a couple of things. You now we'll have our universal law of gravitation that set F equals G M M over R squared. You might have to calculate the force. You're definitely going to have a 2D vector problem, one where you have uh, two or even three vectors that come together and you need to add them up. And it could be in the context of universal law of gravitation, the Coulomb's force, the Coulomb's law, the force between two charges, or an electric field. But make sure, make sure that you can do two uh, 2D vectors. You also need to know, have a good understanding of what the shell theorem is. Remember the shell theorem, Newton showed that if you have a shell of mass, it's the same, at least from the outside, as a point of mass. So if you encounter a shell of mass and you want to know something about, say, the force between that shell and some particle outside of it, then you just treat the shell as a point mass. And that was sort of Newton, one of Newton's big discoveries, a mathematical discovery anyway, that you can treat these shells as point masses. Um, you need to understand the gravitation near Earth's surface. That is that A is equal to uh, big G over M, uh, M times R squared. Remember, we got that by saying this universal law of gravitation is equal to M times G, and then the M's just cancel out. That's where we get that acceleration due to gravity, um, which gives us our value for, our, for G. So be able to calculate that acceleration due to gravity for a particle. Also be aware that this is only for a sphere. We'll see in just a moment. I'll remind you of the, uh, we did also the sphere, the cylinder, and the flat sheet. You'll need to be able to calculate the gravitational field of those things. When I talk about field, I'm talking now about G. This is also the acceleration due to gravity, but it is the force per unit mass, right, because fields are some force per unit something in terms of gravitation, it's per unit mass. In terms of electricity, it's per unit what? Electric fields are force per unit charge, right? But a field is always a force per something. Uh, gravitational is force per unit mass. Charge is force per unit charge. Or electric is force per unit charge. All right. Um, need to know gravitational potential energy. So if I have two masses, say M1, M2, uh, I'll just give you two masses. I'm not going to give you more than two. But if I have two masses, know that I can calculate their total potential energy. U is G M1, M2 over R. Uh, it's a negative value, actually. We'll see that again when we get into chapter two, after we do uh, Gauss's law for electric charges. So we'll, we'll come back to this in chapter two. In fact, a lot of these ideas we're going to see again once or twice more. So the second exam will be in some way similar to the first, just different contexts. No escape speed. The equation is on your equation sheet, but just sort of know how it comes about. Remember we said that the... Uh, that the escape speed is such that the potential and the kinetic energies, they cancel one another out. They become zero, basically. So it's based on this conservation of energy, the idea of conservation of energy, that I need to give myself enough energy in order to escape the gravitational field of the Earth. Let's see, we did do Kepler's laws. Uh, you need to know Gauss's law, and particularly, you should have a rough understanding of how to, how to figure out the... Um, the gravitational field due to those three shapes that we did. We did the sphere, we did the cylinder, and we did the uh, flat sheet. Remember on each of these, in order to find the, uh, this is not escape speed, this is field, fields of these particular things, the gravitational fields, that is the acceleration due to gravity. Uh, we went through derivations for each of these. In short, we used Gauss's law, which said that the flux is equal to negative 4 pi g mass inside the surface. That's your Gaussian surface. The flux is equal to g times the area of your surface. And that's equal to negative 4 pi g 
mass inside that surface. And then, you know, using these ideas, both of which are on your equation sheet, I think, I think flux, the definition of flux is there. I'm not positive, uh, but it, if it's not, you need to know that. Um, on each of these, they work out very similarly, except for the areas are going to be different. Because here you use a Gaussian shape that is spherical in shape, because it mimics the spherical symmetry of the mass that you have. For the cylinder, you'd use a Gaussian shape that is uh, cylindrical. And then for the flat sheet, you use two Gaussian shapes on either side that are flat, just flat sheets, just like the sheet. So um, be able to calculate G for all three of these, or for one of these. And then also just understand how you get to that value. I might ask you to describe in a couple of sentences, you know, how did you find that? You'll see that more and more this semester. I did that some last semester, but I'll ask you to describe your work in words. So as you're going through the problems, think about in words, how would you describe this? Not, I don't want paragraphs, just a sentence or two, or, or even just a few little phrases. Okay? So for example, here you would say, well, I begin with Gauss's law, figure out the area of my Gaussian surface, and then I solve for the acceleration due to gravity. Okay? We went through those derivations in class. Make sure you look at them. That's it for um, chapter zero. Homework will be a good place for you to study. I'd go through the homework if you haven't yet for that chapter. Now, chapter one, we'll come back. If you have questions about this, we can certainly come back to it. Chapter one dealt with forces and fields. And, you know, frankly, it's going to be some similar at least. So with forces, our first, just sort of basic ideas of charge. Look back at your, um, your concept test. They've been posted. I posted them all this morning. And then also look back at your old test. These basic ideas of charge, you know, charge is conserved. Charge is quantized. Uh, protons are immobile, mostly. That means that when I'm talking about things becoming charged, I'm usually talking about electrons moving around, not protons moving around. Because mostly protons are bound tightly in the nucleus and they don't move around very easily. Uh, what else? Repulsive and attractive forces. So they repel and they attract in various ways. Conduction, induction. We went over a couple of examples of charging by both of those methods. Conduction, if things touch, that's conduction. If things don't touch, but they induce a charge in something else, that's charging by induction. Those will be multiple choice questions. All right, But you know, five multiple choice questions, that's 15 points. So uh, they're not, not insignificant. You'll also see Coulomb's law. This will be very similar to the stuff where you have for Newton's universal law of gravitation. Uh, F equals K Q Q over R squared. You might see quantitative. That is, you know, I want you to calculate the force. Or you might just see qualitative. And we did some things like that where I give you a configuration of charges. And I ask you, uh, you know, what is the, which of these is the appropriate vector? Or just sketch in the vectors. Or uh, what are the signs of these charges if this force feels a net force in this direction? We've done questions like that, but take a look back at them in the concept test and in the old test. I uh, could see two-dimensional on that, as I said. Although you only see one 2D problem, not, not two. Also, electric fields. Be able to calculate the electric field due to a collection of point charges. So, for example, if I have a plus Q and a minus Q like this, be able to find the electric field at that point due to this charge, the electric field will be in that direction. Due to this charge, the electric field will be in that direction. And so the net electric field will be in that direction. 2D vector problem again, uh, very similar to the previous two. But be able to calculate that and find the direction and magnitude of the electric fields. Uh, remember, our electric field is 
kq over r squared. Also be able to determine the force due to an electric field. Remember, our electric field is it's defined by the force. In fact, this isn't the definition. The definition is really F equals QE. That's how we define the electric field. Because, you know, a field is just a force per unit charge. Fields in general are forces per unit something, and electric fields are force per unit charge. They're lines of force, these electric fields. So be able to use this equation. Also, perhaps some kinematics, V equals V naught plus AT, uh, X equals V naught T plus one half AT squared. You had one or two questions in your homework that were similar to these. Uh, if you have, you know, a complicated kinematics problem, it'll be like something that you've seen before. I'm not going to give you an off-the-wall kinematics problem, but look back at those. We've seen several in class that we've done. So look back at how these electric fields change the directions of particles. It's kind of important, especially if you're chemistry major, because a lot of your instruments will operate by this, by this technique where you use electric fields to direct charged particles one direction or the other. You can also use them, we'll see later, paired with magnetic fields to determine various properties of those materials. Okay, so electric fields. Um, you did, I did send you a derivation. Listen, it's pretty much a gimme because if you look in the homework, it's in the homework, the solution. So everybody should get it perfectly right. All right, I don't expect anybody to miss that, but it's gonna take you 10 or 15 minutes to go through and sort of do it neatly and all that stuff. Uh, make sure you write a couple sentences describing the derivation. It's a gimme, is that right? It is a gimme, right? It's on the video, I, it's no secret. Did y'all just hear that? I say it out loud? Yeah, it's on the homework video, okay? Well, we didn't do it in class. Um, I just want you to put pen to paper on that. I also want you to be able to draw electric field lines. So I'll give you a configuration of charges, or I might give you a configuration of charges, something like, I don't know, minus four plus three or something like that, and ask you to draw the field lines with the proper perspective. Remember, when we do this, uh, this one's kind of complicated. Let's do four and two. So those are even, even numbers. This one will have twice as many field lines as this one because it has twice as much charge. And then also the field lines come out of this one and go into this one. How can you have twice as many field lines in the negative if they're all coming out of the positive? Let me show you. So uh, let's not put any arrows on them first. I'm going to have twice as many field lines here. It would look like that. And then I would go in and put my arrows in. It would look like that. Now notice if we switch the directions, like if we switch the, uh, the signs rather, if that became positive and that became negative, they would look exactly the same, except the arrows would be going the opposite direction. Good question. Thank you. I'm not sure that we actually did that where we had a scenario like that. But also be able to think about what are the forces at different places, like y'all did in the lab with the uh, electric field hockey. So like if I put a charge somewhere, this sort of goes back to our Coulomb's law, but if I put a charge somewhere, be able to think about what is the direction of the force due to those two charges. And the direction of the force will line up with the direction of the electric field. All right, if you have this on the test, it'll just probably be five points or so. Hopefully, it won't take you that long. So, electric field lines. Oh, yeah, is that it? Yeah, I think that's it. All right. Um, no chapter, what do we call that? 1.5. No Gauss's law like we did. You will see Gauss's law, but not as it relates to electric charges. We're going to see Gauss's law again on, on the next exam with a little bit more, a little bit more detail, but not much more. So go ahead and master it now, and then it's like, you know, a double, a double treat or whatever to get on exam one and exam two. All right, uh, any particular questions first, and then we can look at some of the old exams. No? All right, let's take a few minutes to look at some of the old exams. Remember, the exam is in this room at um, 
seven fifteen on Monday, and I will. Uh, there'll be a seating chart on the door. Uh, yeah, I'll do a. Or maybe I'll just. I'll probably do a seating chart. We'll see. All right, this is last semester. Now, if you go back too far, we haven't been doing gravitational fields for that long, only a couple of years. So if you you can only go back a couple of years to get gravitational field examples, uh, and then also your homework as well and the examples we worked in class. Electric fields and stuff we've been doing, so you can go back as far as you like for those. All right, um, the, mo many of these were from uh, the concept test questions. You can find those online on the website or in, in your workbook. Any of these stand out to you guys? Electric field stuff, electric field stuff. I think you have this one in the back of your book even. Is that true? This is in the back of your book? Yeah, this is spring 16. Uh, draw in the electric fields. Here's one where you find the electric field vectors at point A, asking for the acceleration, the force that it will experience. Uh, let's see, this has to do with uh, Newton's shell theorem. Remember, Newton's shell theorem said that Newton said that this, for, this mass sees this mass just as a point source. So I can imagine this shell just collapsed down to a point as long as you're outside of the shell. If you're inside the shell, it doesn't work the same way. Uh, here's one having to do with the gravitational field for a flat structure from Gauss's law. Uh, this is beam of electrons, two charge plates. We had a homework question that was very similar to this. All right. Anything on that test that y'all want to look through? Sure, number 20. Which one was that? Okay, so we went through these, but be, be prepared to do this. We, um, this was back, you know, several weeks ago when we did this. We have a very large flat structure it has a surface mass density equal to sigma. That's the mass per unit area. And I want to first write an expression for the gravitational field. So I start with the flux is equal to negative 4 pi g mass inside. All right, so don't bother memorizing these because I want to see the work anyway. The flux is equal to g times the area. But if I think about my flat structure, in order to have a good Gaussian surface, it has to surround that structure. So my Gaussian surface is actually going to have two pieces, like a sandwich, right? Like a uh, tomato sandwich, where the, the mass is the tomato, and then you got two pieces of bread on either side. Because it, it catches all the flux that comes out of that mass. And so my area is actually going to be twice the area of the structure. Because my Gaussian surfaces have two pieces of bread, right? So I have twice the area, not a single amount of the area. And then that's equal to negative 4 pi g mass inside. I'm really looking for g. So g, just dividing by the area, is negative 2 pi. Big G, that's a constant. It's in your equation sheet. It's 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Uh, times mass over area. But the only thing different than what we did here is that this mass over area is our surface density. So I can just replace this with sigma. All right. And so that's the, uh, the gravitational field. Now, if I want to know the acceleration at a point, at a point, uh, it was supposed to be 1 times 10 to the 6 meters above this sheet, that would be R. Notice how this is dependent upon R. How is this dependent upon R? It's not. So no matter how high you are, this is still going to be our gravitational field. Just to put in some numbers here, I would say that G is equal to negative 2 pi 
Uh, big G is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times sigma, which is 2, 2 times 10 to the 12th. And then that would be my acceleration due to gravity. Let's see, 6, 36, 72 times 10. It's about 700 meters per second squared, roughly. I don't know what the, the answer was exactly, but it's about 700 meters per second squared. It's a pretty dense sheet of mass. But the remarkable thing is that as far away as you get from it, your acceleration due to gravity it doesn't change. All right? Um, and then if you go to a distance twice as far away, what happens to the gravitational field? Well, what happens? It stays the same, right. Can I say one thing right quick? You can think about this. Remember the, uh, the two metal plates that we did in lab? They were plus and minus. Notice that the electric field, which is denoted by the density of the lines, doesn't change. And so similarly, for a big flat sheet of mass, the gravitational field is always the same. In a similar way that the electric field was always the same here. Emma? So for the would you just never get out of the gravitational field? Right. Mm -hmm. It would always be the same. Now you're assuming a very large flat sheet. Yeah. So it's like it never ends. So it's sort of like if we live in a flat universe, it would be like a flat sheet. All right? Mm -hmm. Or if we live in a very big flat earth, but we don't. One times ten to the six. Oh, yeah, so see, this is just a red herring, as they say. Red herring, is that what they say? Yeah, this it doesn't come into the equation. This is our value for R. Now, if you're looking at a cylinder or a, uh, or a sphere, it would depend upon how far away you go from it. But as far as the, uh, the flat sheet, it doesn't depend upon your distance from the, from the thing. Because notice, there is no R in this. Okay, because the area wasn't dependent upon the radius of your Gaussian surface. Your Gaussian surface didn't have a radius. It didn't have a distance from the center. That's a good question. Yeah, you don't need that at all. Yes, but what is spheres flux? What is a sphere's flux look like? Well, we've done the sphere's flux. The sphere's, or rather, uh, the sphere's gravitational field for a sphere is, uh, what is it, gm over r squared. Right, that's the acceleration due to gravity. And you would do it in a similar way. I think that's really what you're asking is how you would find it for a sphere. You would say, start with the flux negative 4 pi g mass inside. This is g times the area equals negative 4 pi g mass inside. And really the only thing you gotta know is what is the area of your Gaussian surface? And so my area of my Gaussian surface is the area of a sphere and that's equal to uh, g times 4 pi r squared equals negative 4 pi g mass inside. That would be like the Earth, the planet, the mass of the Earth. Notice the 4 pi's cancel, and I'm left with my value for g, which is, the, I'm left with my value for the gravitational field, which is, which is g m over r squared. Listen, all those, you don't have to memorize the formulae for the areas because they're all on your equation sheet. Make sure you look over your equation sheet and know what's on there because there's a lot of information. You got the area of the, the sphere, the cylinder, the 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 square. I mean, y'all know the area of the square, but you might have forgotten the cylinder and that business. Yes. So in this case, the question is going to be change the plate to a sphere. Question B would be relevant. Right. Question B would you would have a value for r. It would go in right here, the r squared. Right with the with the earth. The gravitational field lines actually diverge. So as you get further and further away, the gravitational field decreases more and more. Good thing, right? Because otherwise you wouldn't be able to go to space or whatever. All right. I, I didn't meet this guy, but I heard about him as I had a, an astronomer friend, and he was riding on the train, talking about the flat earth. Riding on this train in Europe or somewhere, and this guy sat next to him, found out he was an astronomer, and the guy said he had this wacky idea that the Earth was round, it was a sphere, although some people still think the Earth is flat, but he thought the Earth was round, 
But he didn't think that we lived on the outer part of the earth. He thought that we lived on the inside of the earth. And that, like, the sun was actually, like, the molten rock core of the earth. It was really wacky. You get the picture, like, the earth is a big hollow ball, and we walk around on the inside of that hollow ball. And he was basing this on the idea, takes off the shoe on the train, and, you know, when you look at your shoe, how does it look? It's sort of curved. And he says that it's curved because, I mean, it's curved because we walk like this. But it's curved because you're walking on the inside of the shoe. Think about that. Right? Oh no, it's going to make it in the nickel's work, right? Yeah. <laughs> Expose. Discovery. All right. Um, Y'all clear on that? I want you to know Gauss's Law, okay? You're going to see Gauss's Law on the test in some way. Uh, be, be sure that you know how to use it because we're going to see it again soon. Uh, anything else on this test? Yeah, Josh? Mm -hmm. Don't worry, don't worry. You're not going to see anything inside a ring. All right. So really, the shell theorem, all you got to know is just that if I'm outside the shell, which you will be in this case, uh, just read like one now. All right. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Is that okay to skip that question? Do you have other things? I think all the vectors that I have you do, I want you to find the magnitude and direction. But you know how to do the i and j notation. I mean, let me let me just show you because it is important, but I don't think it comes up on the test. Like if I have a vector that has an x component, say that is our y component that is two newtons, and an x component that's minus three newtons, right? I could express it in i j k notation as just the force is negative 3i plus 2j. In fact, that's a lot easier than finding the magnitude and direction. Right, so this is just an intermediate step. If I want to find the magnitude, I do the square root of 3 squared plus 2 squared. And if I want to find the direction, I do theta is the inverse tan of 2 over 3. So uh, I'm not going to say no, but I don't think there are any where I asked you to express it in IJK notation. I'm pretty sure. But notice this is just an intermediate step. It's just, uh, it's not just, it is showing the x and the y components and the z components, but you won't see any 3d. Okay, does that answer your question, Nicole? Yeah. Oh. What was 19? Oh yeah, so uh, a shell, if I have a shell, you just treat it like a point mass. So if I want to know the force between these two masses, the force is G, mass of the point, mass of the shell, divided by D squared. Doesn't matter that I got a shell, as Newton said, for this shell theorem, that this shell I can collapse down to a point. And so I just treat it like a point mass. Newton's, uh, Newton's law of gravitation. And then in one to three sentences, what did Newton say? He said, a shell of mass looks to an outside point mass as a point mass. All right. We went over that, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's simple. Oh, well, you know, masses can't see, right? Yeah, but, uh, but it, it, it brings curiosity to the, um, to the L theory. <laughs> What's the L theory? That whenever a door is closed and something's not observed, it simply does not exist. So the person behind me does not exist right now because nothing observed. Something's still there. He's still there. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. Well, you know, the point is that the force that this particle feels due to this shell of mass 
is the same as if this shell of mass was just a tiny little point of mass. That it, it wasn't a shell, it was a point. I don't know about the elf theory. Well, the elf was um, that if the elf was the whole thing is that it's like whenever you look at it, elves appear in a split second of time and remake it and then they vanish. So you only get to see that for a second. And that is a little strange. It's very quantum ish. Mm -hmm. Quantum physics. All right. We'll talk about that a little later. We'll get in. Oh no, we're not doing that in class. I'm sorry. That's a fun chapter. All right. That sucks, doesn't it? What's the chapter? On diffraction. Because if you look at like they, you can have electrons or, or particles go through a diffraction grating, and depending on how you look at them, sometimes they look like a wave, and sometimes they look like a particle. Yeah. And so that's why we describe things with this wave-particle duality. Sometimes light is a wave, or is a particle. But high-energy particles do the same thing. All right. Any other questions? How y'all feel about the exam? Feel not prepared? Yeah? Alright. My other class, I think it's probably the hardest exam. I'm not sure that's the case for this class. But, uh, we, we haven't gotten this far enough potentials and stuff. But it's not an easy exam, so please do prepare for it. I want you to do as well as well as possible. Alright, Nicole. Number two on the chat. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just. Uh, chapter one, you say? Okay, yeah. So, uh, in order to do this, you want to find the force on the six nanocoulomb charge. You want to draw your force due to this charge So um, I'm not going to work through all of it. It takes a little while. But you want to sketch in your vectors. I draw the force due to this charge. They're both positive, so they repel. And then the force due to this charge, they're opposite, so they attract. And then I think about what is my coordinate system here and here. I need to figure out what this angle is. I don't know what that angle is, but I can, I can find it. We can go over this later. We can go over the details if you want. But, uh, and then I have F13 and F12. That's the magnitude of these forces. Um, I calculate the magnitudes of the forces. And then I find the X and Y components of that vector. And then I add them up. Listen, we can, why don't we, uh, we'll go over it. If anybody wants to go over a 2D vector problem, we can do so. But since we're getting close to the end, if y'all want to be excused, that's fine too. But I'm going to go through this 2D vector problem. You are going to have a 2D vector problem. So if you feel like you got it because you mapped it, that's fine. I'll be able to do this. Is that okay, y'all? Are there any other types of questions? Jesse? You want to see this? Okay. Awesome. So, y'all okay hanging around over okay. here? Yeah, okay. But if you want to go, that's fine too. Um, so. All right, so what I'm going to do here is first find the magnitudes. So like F13 is KQQ over R squared. That's Q1, Q3, that's 9 times 10 to the 9th. Q1 is 6 times 10 to the minus 9. And Q3 is 3 times 10 to the minus 9. And then... Yeah, of course. Okay, is this uh, Coulomb's constant? It's the nine times ten to the ninth. It's on your equation, so 
for the future. But yeah, yeah. it's just a constant. Uh, we'll see it a little bit later. It's based on based on the Fermi energy in free space, but it's just a constant that's relating that force to Q Q and R squared. It's a constant. All right. We'll get to it later. We'll talk about it later. All right. Um, and then the distance is the distance from this point up to this point. Notice that's a triangle, right? It's 2 meters, 5 meters, square root of 4 plus 25. That's equal to the square root of 29. So I do uh, square root of 29 squared under there. And then I calculate that force. Does anybody, has anybody done the homework and they just know what that force is right off? No way it's done the homework? Yeah. Yeah, it's 5.6 times 10 to the minus 9. Okay. 5.6 times 10 to the minus 9. And then you do the same thing for F12. And F12 is just below that. What is it? All right, so I found the magnitudes of these two vectors. This is the 5.4 number. This is the 5.6 number. Now, the way I found this F12 is I say K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. That would be K times this charge times this charge, 4 times 10 to the minus 9, divided by 2 squared. It would be K times this charge times this charge, divided by 2 squared, which is the distance. Okay, now once I have those, I also need to figure out what is this angle. Uh, that angle is the same as this angle. Wait, no, it's not. I'm sorry. It's not the same as that angle. It's actually the same as this angle. I'll call this angle... This angle right here, the theta, is the same as this angle. I know it's a little confusing. Let me draw that triangle. Um, I'm going to draw that triangle right here. So these two angles right here are the same. If you want, you could find this angle and take 90 from it, or take it from 90. And so theta, then, is the inverse tan of 2 over 5, which, what is that angle theta? Well, then I would have to take 90 minus it. Okay, no, no, no. All right. It would be 68 degrees. Or 22 for the... 22 degrees. Okay, so that is 22 degrees. All right, so now... I can redraw my coordinate system. I'm going to have F13, which is 5.6 times 10 to the minus 9, sine of 22. 5.6 times 10 to the minus 9, cosine of 22. And then I have F12, which is in this direction, which is 5.4 times 10 to the minus 8. And now it's, it's just a vector exercise. I mean, the whole problem is really just a vector exercise, but it's important for the class. I want y'all to master it. Um, now the next step is I combine my x and y vectors. I only have one in the x direction, so I have to combine anything. I have two here. The sum of those is going to give me Five point four times ten to the minus eight minus five point six to the minus nine. What is that sum? Or rather, five point six times ten to the minus nine minus five point four times ten to the minus eight. What is that equal to? Do you have that value there? Oh, 
Hold on, let me check. But what about this, uh, sign of 22? Oh, yes. Sign of 22, thank you. I get minus 5.2 times 10 to the minus 8. So this is uh, 5.2 times 10 to the minus 8. So now if we were to write our force, we would say F is equal to 5.6 times 10 to the minus 9 in the I direction minus 5.2 times 10 to the minus 8 in the J direction. Okay, now come over here one more step. We need to do the magnitude of F. with the Pythagorean Theorem. <coughs> That'll give the magnitude. And then I want to find the angle of the vector. My resultant vector is here. That's angle theta. So theta then is equal to the inverse tan of 5.2. That's the y component. Divided by 5.6 times 10 to the minus 9. That's the x component, and that gives me the angle. What was the ang that angle theta? Yeah, 84 looks right, because the y component is so much bigger. 84 degrees below the plus x axis. Gosh, you're right. Yes, yes, yes. What? This is what you have on here for the. Yes. Okay. So there should be a cosine here. Cosine of 22. That's what you were saying too, right? Mark? Yeah. So cosine of 22. Um, I get 84 degrees. You have to put in this cosine of 22. Nicole, that's why yours looked a little bit different right here. Okay, because of that cosine. And that gives me the magnitude, or the direction, rather. All right. Probably if you have one, it won't have... Well, no, no I didn't really take that back. I try to make the numbers as easy as possible. In this one, the numbers sort of... You have a lot of big, big or small numbers. I try to make them as easy as possible, but you do need to know how to go through this process of adding up two vectors and two dimensions. All right? If you can't do that, make sure that you can do it by Monday. I'm, I'm around most of the morning. I'm here till 10.30. In the afternoon, I have to leave at 2. We have a meeting at 2 that's off campus. But uh, if you need help before and during that time, let me know. Any other questions, John? What is it? Is it dope? No. Oh, okay. It's about the universe. The universe is infinite, right? Uh, I don't know. Is this my year? No, I, I just don't know. Sorry, I don't know. I, but people don't know, for sure. <laughs> some people say yes, yeah, some people say no. I was just reading it because they were saying that the infinite, like the universe is infinite, but like the observable, the like, universe is not. Right, that's true. So we can, you know, uh huh. That's all we can see. Right. So it's like, what's outside the universe? I don't know. Sorry. What is there outside? Uh, I don't know, Dustin. I'm sorry. It's, 